What a roller coaster ride at the Travelers Championship this year in Cromwell, Connecticut. Let's look at the data that matters and talk about Ches Revy. Let's tee it up. Welcome to Data Access Golf, your home for rapid golf improvement. And now, from the thin air of the Rocky Mountains, next on the number one tee, your host, Aaron Stewart. Hey everyone, Aaron Stewart, Data Access Golf, the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Um, really a fun weekend of golf, for sure. It was, um, I mean, coming off the U.S. Open, you always kind of hope for something that's a little more relaxing, a little more enjoyable. I think it was the perfect there at the TPC River Highlands in Cromwell, Connecticut. was an, an awesome spot. You had some locals there in Keegan Bradley playing really well. You had a sort of a long shot Cinderella story going on, um, which was awesome, right? With uh, and, and that was truly amazing with that Zach Suchers little run there for the first two days. And uh, even, even really, he got through the 45 holes with a five-stroke, six-stroke lead. Uh, really, so really amazing, cool stuff there. And then also this journeyman in Ches Revy who – um, sometimes doesn't look like the uh, typical golfer as far as his motion and everything goes to get it done, to hang in there. And with, with, with Keegan Bradley coming pretty hard until that double bogey on 17, super interesting tournament for sure. A lot of cool stories have come out of it. Um, but congratulations to Ches Revy. What has that done for him? We'll get into it in the data that matters, and we'll talk about our benchmarks and all that good stuff. But um, I wanted to first touch on there, – actually, there's been a lot of really great golf, right? I mean, Jerry Kelly winning in Madison, Wisconsin for the AmFam Championship uh, in a playoff with Retief Goosen and Steve Stricker. Craziness. Right? Obviously, Steve Stricker, a very good friend of Jerry Kelly. They both there are in Wisconsin. And Steve Stricker kind of put it together with AmFam. And, and uh, then Retief Goosen, right? I mean, that is a sweet swing. His swing compared to Jerry Kelly's is – Something else, but Jerry Kelly, Jerry Kelly gets it done, sleeping in his own bed in front of the home crowd. Very cool. That's a very cool win, and it is interesting, right? Isn't it too? Because these are the guys that I kind of remember. They were the journeymen and the guys that you kind of pulled for when I watched a lot of um, PG Tour golf when I was younger. And um, you know, now they're in their fifties on the fifties tour. I obviously am in early, my early fifties, so these are kind of like right. These are these are my guys that are now on. The Champions Tour and playing against each other is super fun. And Retief Goosen, I mean, everybody wanted Retief Goosen's swing as far back as I can remember. It's just so pretty and so perfect. Still is. I mean, still looks extraordinary. So really cool win there. Um, LPGA, another major, uh, the KPMG, um, Green getting that one done. I, I Really kind of an interesting story there, too. Talked about how uh, Christy Kerr had started um, – and, and, and really, this uh, uh, Christy Kerr had, had started this scholarship trying to bring um, Australians into golf, young Australian girls into golf, and then get them over onto the LB, LPGA Tour. And so some of the quotes, and, and, and this uh, Green, her, her, she came through the program with, um, with Christy Kerr. And so Christy Kerr was kind of her mentor, mentor in getting all that going. So she said that when they interviewed her that she was just as nervous as she ever was um, <laughs> when she was playing herself, which I thought that was uh, pretty cool and, and interesting for sure. But she uh, played really well, had kind of a big lead as well like Ches Revy and just kind of stayed on it and got it all, and got it all done and, fi and, finished, and finished it up. And to do it too with – I mean you have got – um, it was a, it at least had a similar feel, I think, to me when you look at it because she had a big lead going into it, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and it's from Hazeltine, right, which is a gorgeous golf club. All of a sudden, Sung Hyun Park, who's the defending champion, starts screaming up, throws down a 68, and starts screaming up the leaderboard, and actually finishes second. Uh, obviously ahead of Hannah Green, and Hannah had to just hold on and be tough and make a five-footer on the last one to get it done. And obviously that Christy Kerr was excited. She was excited. 
And as Aussies do, right, she got a, a beer bath, Budweiser beer bath there to celebrate. But really cool there. Just a really great weekend of golf, for sure, on every single tour, honestly. Um, but we are going to talk about the PGA Tour and Ches Reedy's big win. I guess, you know what, I really wanted to talk a little bit about um, Zach Suture. I, I, and I hope I'm saying his name right, and if I'm not, I apologize to Zach. But it's one of these feel-good stories where, um, you know, he's, he's um, had some injuries, had to have surgery, had to take a medical exemption back in 2017. He's been going on this medical exemption for a long time. Um, Got in as a sponsor exemption, uh, one of two, into this field, and then went out and and led the tournament for 45 holes, playing better than anybody out there. I mean, lapping Brooks Koepka, um, lapping really good Bubba Watson and Paul Casey, people that have done very, very well at the TPC um, River Highlands. And he was just putting on a clinic and then had a really tough um, back nine on Saturday where, and then Ches Reevy just went absolutely crazy. And so you go from a, he went from a five stroke lead to where Ches Reevy was six clear of the field. And that had to be completely devastating for Zach. And, and because he, he, he said he went seven months without any income. And I get that. That's not a good way to live. And now he's looking at trying to make something of himself on tour uh, with this medical exemption. And um, the stress of all of that to get this exemption. I think he had, I don't know, three or four events left to try to make up the points that he needed to stay. And again, I don't remember the points, but I think he's like within 73 points now and he's qualified finishing in a top 10 for the, um, for the, um, what is it? The, uh, Quicken, is it the Quicken loans tournament over in Detroit this week? That's where they'll be. Uh, but it was so neat to see this Zach yesterday go low again, throw down a 67, finish tied second, pick up a huge check that makes their lives a little more comfortable. And I'm sure that drive now from Connecticut to Michigan will be a much better one than the drive up to Connecticut. So congratulations to Zach Suture as well. Really cool. Congratulations to Keegan Bradley to play well in front of the home crowd, essentially. Really cool. Paul Casey, again, comes flying up the leaderboard and finishes in in fifth place. Uh, He just does well on this course. So really cool tournament all the way around. Okay, so I wanted to jump into then the numbers of Ches Reevy. Um, these are what we call our benchmark, well, they, they're our performance numbers, and to see how Ches got it kind of done. Some fun little facts on Ches Reevy. He's 37 years old. He joined the PGA Tour in 2004. He's won twice now, obviously yesterday, and then he won earlier in t- 2008 the Canadian Open. So that's kind of a cool. I think the Canadian Open, at least for me, is kind of a bigger win than just a standard um, PGA Tour. I mean, it's a national championship up in Canada, our neighbors to the north, and my mother's Canadian, so maybe that's why I also think it's an awesome awesome tournament to win. He's played in the Travelers, Travelers Championship now nine times. Okay. And between victories... Right, 2008 to 2019, it's 11 years, but it's also the 11th longest span for a PGA Tour player between victories since 1900. So that was also quite a big feat. He's a journeyman. He just keeps playing and and working, but it's kind of cool. We'll look into the numbers here. He's actually trending very well over the course of the last five years. His best results in a major, I thought this was interesting, his best, his game seemed like it would play, it would, it would do well in the Masters, but his lowest finish in the Masters is 53rd. His lowest in the PG Championship is 12th, tied 12th. And his lowest in the U.S. Open was just last week, where he tied for third, picked up a great deal of confidence, and then came into the Travelers and played super well. And then at the British Open, he has never made the cut. And yes, I'm calling it the British Open. I had a little rant on that. You can check that out on the Facebook Live. I won't rant now. We're going to keep this short and sweet for the podcast listeners. We've already had quite a bit on other tours that we didn't talk about on the live earlier today. And this was a cool, this was a cool thing, I thought. 
So Ches Reevy is the last PGA Tour winner to regain his tour card from the PGA Tour Q School. Right? We don't have it anymore, um, but he's the last one to do that. So that's kind of a cool thing. And I have to throw out there, Ches Reevy is an ASU devil, Sun Devil, Go Devils. We all know I love my ASU Devils, graduate school there, go SU. Okay, what did this do? What did this victory do for Ches Reevy then? Well, his FedEx Cup ranking went from 35th to 12th, so almost got him into the top 10. That right there will tell you how Ches Reevy's doing this year. He was not going to worry about keeping his tour card this year. He's playing quite well. Now all the way up to 12th with a victory that comes with a couple years of exemption status, which is fantastic. As far as his world golf ranking, he went from 48th in the world all the way up to 26th. So excellent there. As far as his consistent C rating, which is, as everyone knows, who listens here to Data Access Golf, we geek out about data. It's essentially the cuts made for their career divided by the events they have entered. So Ches Reevy has entered 278 events and he has made 173 cuts, which puts, which, which puts him at a consistency rating of 62%. Now, we're going to find that to be very interesting because when we look at the five-year trend, which we started doing a couple weeks ago, we'll see that Chez is actually doing quite well, and yet his number is still quite low, which just means that from 2004 when he joined the tour um, till 2015 when we actually started looking at his trend, he, he actually played quite a bit worse than 62% and had to requalify, as we talked about already. So we'll see that sort of factor in when we look at it. So uh, Chez's consistency rating then is 62% of cuts made for his career, which would put him in the consistency scale of a good player from 60 to 69. Others who have won this year at that level, Kisner, McDowell, Pan, Palmer, Na, and Reevy, right? We've now put Reevy in there. Those that make 59% and below are what we call those that should be worried about their card. So card question mark is the consistency label there. Connors, Homa, and Kang are those that have won this year in that very low 59% and below area and have picked up a couple of years of exemption. So good for them. And obviously once you get exempt, you have the opportunity to play more tournaments and we would expect those consistency numbers to rise for those players. Uh, those that are in our solid category who have won this year, which is a 70 to 79 to, uh, mean uh, career consistency number, Holmes, Mitchell, Casey, and Woodland, who won last week, right, at the U.S. Open, are elite status players. Those that make between 80 and 89% of their cuts over the course of their career Kepka, McElroy, Molinari, Dustin Johnson, Mickelson, Rose, and Cantley just snuck in after his last um, win. And then legend status. Those who have won with a consistency number for their career of 90% or above only won uh, Tiger Woods. He's the only one to be up in that 90% for his career who has won this year. So cool. As far as trending goes, we like to throw this in because... And a very good, it was actually a very good suggestion by a listener who said, hey, you talk about this consistency number of the course of their career. It doesn't really give us an idea of how they've been playing recently. Yes, uh, point well taken. So we've put together this. I just go back from 2015 up until the present time, looking at five years, including the current year. So back in 2015, his consistency number, Ches's consistency, consistency number was 63%, which is his overall number now, right? It's lower than his, which is higher than his overall number at 62%, which just leads us to know, not believe, but know that he was below that 63% considerably to still have a number as low as 62% now, especially when we look at these next numbers. Um, in 2016, his consistency number was 67%. So came up a little bit. He made over $1 million dollars. In 2017, his consistency number was up to 76%. He made $1.9 million and had, 100, had 1,152 FedEx cut points. 2018 dipped a little bit as far as his, consist, his cut number went, down to 70% of the tournaments entered, but he made more money, 
almost a million dollars more. He made $2.7 million. So when he did make a cut, he went, he did very well in the weekend, which suggests he's trending in the right direction. He's learning to play better on the weekends, right? Which is great. Now, if he can make more cuts and he plays well on the weekends, we should see some really good things. And we've seen that in 2019. He has, um, he has made the cut 81% of the times, 81% of the time in 2019. He has accrued $3.5 million so far this year. And we still have, obviously, tournaments to play and the playoffs coming and a whole nother major, right? So excellent move for um, Ches Reeve. And he, he now has 1,274 FedEx Cup points, which is higher than any, any total he has had in an entire year previously. So trending in the right direction and learning to play well on the weekends when he does make a cut. So Ches Reeve at 38 really looks like he has figured some things out, which is interesting because if you look at his golf swing, and I, I mentioned this um, on the live we probably should look at his golf swing because there's definitely some things in that golf swing that would lead you to believe that he would be an inconsistent player. And yet he has found a great deal of consistency, which would lead you to believe that he has either sort of figured it out and grooved it, or um, he has found something that is very natural to him, that he that's very repeatable. Um, we'd have to talk to him to figure out which of, which of those it is. But by looking at it, I think we can probably get a pretty good idea of, of what we're looking at. Okay, so let's jump into these benchmarks. Again, benchmarks are numbers that we have calculated from the, 20, from the 2018 PGA Tour stats found on PGATour.com. And we have calculated essentially where we believe our game should be, um, what, what, uh, where we should determine if our games have need of work or not in order to consider our games to have to be of tour quality. Okay, so Ches Reeve, we'll look at that, what they did for the tournament and kind of get an idea of where they actually won it. And then we'll look at his 2018 numbers and compare them to our benchmarks that were created from the PGA Tours 2018 stats, right? So driving accuracy for this tournament, uh, the Travelers, 80, he hit 84% of his fairways. For 2018, he averaged 72%. So a very good driving week for Ches Reeve for sure. Our benchmark for driving accuracy is 55%. We should be hitting 55% or more of our fairways as amateurs. And if we do so, that would make us more proficient than Phil Mickelson, Tony Finau, and Jimmy Walker, right, for driving numbers. Again, trying to establish here that these are tour quality benchmarks and accurate. Um, definitely, um, definitely good, reliable numbers to base our game off of. Okay, so greens and regulation for the tournament, the Travelers. Uh, Ches Reeve averaged 75% of his greens hit in regulation, which is uh, interesting because he hit 84% of his fairways. But again, you've got a golf course with a lot of movement in it. So he may not have had the best angles in sometimes. Still hit the fairway, but maybe not have had the best angles in. Typically, when you see 84% in a fairway, you would expect to see greens and regulation somewhere around there. The data shows, but this is actually lower. Well, we've got a course with a lot of movement, and that's where we do tend to see maybe some difference in that. Tougher greens to hit, um, like Pebble Beach, for example. That's another course where we see um, driving accuracy and, GR, and GIR numbers being uh, have some disparity because those greens are so small. All right, so he averaged 75% for the tournament. For 2018, he averaged 69%. So again, he performed better than his 2018 averages, which would lead you to believe that he could actually win that tournament, and he did. Though, I see, 65% greens in regulation is our benchmark. We should be hitting 65% of our greens. We don't take into consideration whether it's in the rough or out of the rough or in the sand trap or whatever. It's just a straight up 65%, okay? Those that average less than 65% greens in regulation, again, Phil Mickelson, Jason Duffner, and Patrick Reed. Again, good players. That's what we're talking about. Sand saves. For the tournament, um, Reeve averaged 75% up and down out of the sand. Very strong performance out of the sand. His 2018 number is 43% out of the sand. So much better there out of the sand than his average. And our benchmark is 45%. So... Those who finished less than 45% out of the sand for 2018, Tony Finau, Bubba Watson, Gary Woodland, and Ches Reeve. So we would say, hey, Ches, 
let's work on that sand game a little bit. Now, he was 75% up and down, so maybe he's already listened to us and worked on his game there. Tony Finau, actually, um, he's the nicest guy in the world. We got to play with him a little bit. He gave me a sand um, lesson while we were playing, which had been super, which was super, super helpful to me. So it's weird to see Tony Finau getting up and down out of the sand less than 45%. Although I think the problem is... The lesson he he t- he got this lesson and shared that he shared with me. He actually got um, from his uh, instructor at the time, who is um, will remain nameless. I'm not going to do that. We'll just leave it alone. So his previous teacher taught him this, and it maybe isn't the best technique in the world. Uh, uh, Tony Fina has a much better coach now, and his play shows it. We'll leave it at that. Okay, strokes game putting for Ches Revi, excuse me, and the Travelers. He averaged 1.2 strokes above the field per round, right? So for a grand total of 6.8 strokes over the course of those four days, he had a very good putting week. Um, in 2018, he only averaged 0.19, so 0.2 strokes, less than one stroke per, per tournament. And this particular tournament, he averaged almost seven. So six strokes better, excellent. Putting round for uh, Ches Revi. Um, now putting, we're going to get into putting here really quickly. I didn't actually um, get into, I probably should have, but I didn't. I didn't actually get into um, scrambling numbers for Ches Revi. Uh, maybe, maybe should, I guess. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll look at those. So Ches Revi for... Um, and again, this is a number that it's super frustrating to me because they don't, ever since the stroke gain numbers have started to come out, we have seen less and less um, really cool numbers that we can use uh, personally, which I have a real problem with because strokes gain only is a per field number and yes they give you an average over the course of of um, the year which we have looked at but for us it's very hard for us to use stroke gain numbers in our own game and so we have to look at other numbers to ch- kind of figure out um, to kind of figure out where we need to work on our game and so the scrambling numbers used to be something that were available right from the main screen. And now that they've, they've moved to the strokes game, they've taken the scrambling number and they've buried it, which I don't really uh, enjoy. So anyway, as far as Ches Revi's scrambling number for 2018, we don't really have it for the tournament, but he averaged 62% scrambling around the green. Our benchmark for that is 55%. So he would be, again, above... Our, our benchmark numbers there. Those that hit, um, who, who get up and down less than 55% on the PGA Tour in 2018 were Adam Scott, Gary Woodland, and Jason Kokrak. Okay, again, solid number there. So five, five foot and in putting. We used to look at 20 to 25 and a bunch of different ones. We now only look at five feet. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but Ches Revi makes six, 79% of his five footers. Our benchmark for five footers is 80%. Those that make less than 80% of the five-footers, Ian Poulter, John Rahm, Kevin Na, and Ches Revi, right? This is the second area in which he doesn't perform quite up to our, our, our benchmark. So we'd say, Ches, hey, let's spend some time in the sand and let's spend, spend some time with your five-footers based on our benchmarks. So Ches could work on those parts of the game. Ches averages 29.12 putts per round in 2018. Our benchmark there is 30 I've considered putting it down to 29 to just make it a little tougher, but I'll leave it at at 30 there. Patrick Cantlay is one of those guys that makes less than that, and Jason Kokrak as well, okay? As far as five-footers go, and I'm going to touch on this until it becomes, um, I guess it just kind of really depends on, it doesn't, it doesn't depend on anything. The new strategy, I'll I'll keep hammering on this to try to get it and make some sense of it. So the new putting strategy that I've embraced, and I hope all of you as amateurs will embrace, I believe will make your lives much easier and make your games much better and more consistent. And that is spending all your time putting, at least 80 to 90% of your time putting from five feet and in. Okay, 
And I know we have a benchmark set here at 80%. It's ridiculous. I want. I was going to move it to 90%, but when you go and look at the PGA Tour pros who make less than 90% of their putts, I mean, there's some fantastic putters there. So I didn't want to do that. That seemed a bit ridiculous. So I'll leave it at 80%. But I want to explain why I, I'm so... I, I'm, I don't know. I'm just so adamant about this. It's based on data. And let me... And, and it's based on science. And let me try to frame this a little way. Um, there is a book, a seminal book, a very important book and as far as how our brain works. And Fred Shoemaker and Extraordinary Golf, they had us go through this book 10, 12 years ago. I can't really remember. But I remember reading it and it changing the way I learned. It, it, it changed the way I thought about learning. And it changed the way I learned golf. Um, that's why I've embraced technology because it gives us the opportunity to engage in what the author, this Daniel Coyle, calls deep practice. And it's such a fascinating and amazing thing to think about. So when I talk about working on five footers, I, I want us to get to a point where, one, we have to stay super motivated to work on these five footers, but it's really about moving into a place where we can, we can practice this whole idea of, of being very deliberate of breaking down our putting stroke and how we hit the ball and, and being so focused on just this five foot, these five footers and in that we, be, we, we become so good at them and so talented at these five footers that they become no brainers. They become so simple that we don't even have to think about it. Now, how the process and how that becomes simple is when you work on a task and it's a task that you do a number of times, we develop these neural pathways. And these neural pathways, when we use them, every time the, um, uh, the uh, electricity fires from, uh, from our brain, the pulse comes from our brain and runs through these neural networks and all these nerves fire in order to create some kind of a movement, we develop around this neural pathway something that's called myelin. It's an, it, we used to think it's just insulation, but it's, and it does thicken and it protects this neural pathway from interference and makes it so this neural pathway becomes super efficient. So somebody who becomes really talented at something, that activity has, has become a neural pathway that is very protected by this myelin. Okay? And the way to develop a really thick layer of myelin and create these super efficient um, neural pathways is to, to do what this author calls deep practice. And what deep practice is, is when you're practicing something and it's not working, that when, you, when it fails and you make an adjustment, that thickens the myelin level, right? So failure actually becomes a really big part of developing these super strong, effective, and efficient neural pathways. So if we spend a lot of time with these five-footers and in and get super, super good at them, and again, I'm, I'm not saying... Practice them in the office, practice them at home, practice them wherever. But if we get really, really good at these five footers, it will become a no brainer. We, we will not get nervous. We will have total confidence that we can rattle in a five footer, no problem. It doesn't matter if it comes to, it, obviously, we'll, we'll be more nervous if it comes for like to win a club championship or in a match or whatever. But because we have created these neural pathways that are so protected by a thick layer of myelin, we will become super efficient and frankly, super talented. Talent can be learned. So we can become amazing, talented, five foot and in putters by this deliberate practice process. Okay. So what does that do for us? And this is where I hope that it expands and makes sense. If we get so really good at five footers, what does that mean? Well, that means that when we're chipping a golf ball or we're in a sand trap or we have a long lag putt, we're looking at a 10 foot wide alleyway where we want to stop that ball, both left and right. This big, huge 10 foot circle around that hole, right? Left and right and front and back. It's a 10-foot circle surrounding that hole. Well, when you picture a, that you have to take this golf ball and finish it somewhere within a 10-foot circle, that takes a lot of pressure. You don't have to feel so precise. We're not worried about making it in a, a two-foot, a two-inch hole. We're just worried about putting it into a 10-foot circle. It takes the pressure off completely. You will make more just because the pressure is gone. And then if you know that you can make a five-footer with your eyes closed... 
what does that do for your birdie putts that are 15, 20, 25 feet? Will you be a little bit more aggressive? Will you put it a couple feet by the hole, knowing darn well you can make the comebacker, especially if you get to see the ball go by the hole? That's, a, that's nothing for somebody who has, has worked deliberately on their practice, on their putting stroke from five feet and in. When you're chipping the ball and you only have to get it within a 10-foot circle, that becomes a piece of cake. Um, even from a sand trap, a 10-foot circle looks a lot, a lot bigger than a 2-inch hole. So I hope that that frees you up a little bit. You can become, we can teach ourselves to become amazing 5-foot putters. And if we've done that and we build up that neural pathway and it becomes super insulated by, by myelin and, and we become talented. We are talented five foot putters. And we save our time for that five foot and in. It changes our game. It will change your game. You will love putting. You will love chitty, chipping. You will love sand shots because you've taken the pressure off your game. And, and you've put your, the pressure of your game on the part of your game you are most talented at because you did went through all this deliberate practice. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Okay, so I wanted to, let's get back to Ches Reeve's big week and what he's done. This is always a fun part. We look at the money. What the money did for Ches Reeve. Well, he, at, at, he won $1.296 million for his big victory. He did that in a total of 263 strokes, which mean, means he won two, $324,000 a day or averaged $324,000 a day which equates to $64,800 an hour, assuming a five-hour round, which means he made roughly $5,000 per stroke. So his total career earnings now are almost $15 million, $14.9 million. He has made 173 cuts, which means Ches Reeve averages $86,401 per cut. Now that's gone up. Um, that is, as far as a career, that is the lowest of any champion this year, $86,401. I honestly did not think that it could go lower. Um, but but, uh, but Ches Reeve has a very long career and, and struggled all the way up to 2015, obviously, lost his card. And so, yeah, per cut, he makes $86,000, again, for his entire career, $86,401. Um, as far as uh, those that do well in this category, Tiger Woods is at number one. Tiger Woods makes $367,000 per cut. He's made over $118 million on tour. We have got Rory McIlroy, who makes $340,000 per cut. And his total career money, forty-five, almost $46 million dollars. We've got Dustin Johnson in third. He makes almost $300,000 per cut. And he has made a total in his career of $60 million. Justin Thomas is actually fourth on this list. He has made 102 cuts and he makes 273,000, almost $274,000 per cut. And coming in fifth, who do you think? Obviously Brooks Kepka, who has taken the uh, major uh, titles by storm. Right, that seems to be where he's most focused. Um, Brooks Kepka has made 96 cuts. He averages averages $256,000 per cut, which is amazing when you see how he plays when it's not a major. It's just hard for him to get into it. Total career money for Brooks Kepka, $24,583,000. So there we go there, ladies and gentlemen. That's essentially how um, Ches Reedy got it done. Um, obviously, he got it done by hitting more fairways, 12 points higher than his average. He got it done by hitting 6% uh, higher greens and regulation. He got it done by getting up and down out of the sand by 32% more than he normally did. He averaged, he, he, got, he averaged six strokes more for the four days than he did in 2018 on the putting greens. He did amazingly well this week to win the tournament. We will now see him next in Detroit. That is our next stop. It's the first time the PGA Tour has stopped at the Detroit Country Club. So I don't, or I don't know if it's the, maybe it's the Detroit Golf Club. I don't remember if it's a country club or not. 
It's the first time we've seen this uh, play. So that will be interesting to see. Obviously, Michigan's beautiful this time of year. They came through a very wet, wet winter. So it should be really green and lush and thick. And I would imagine it would be a lot of fun. But nobody's played this, nobody has played this uh, course. So I don't know how you would come up with your fantasy picks this week. Good luck. Good luck there. We'll see how that goes. So anyway, until next time, Aaron Stewart saying better data always means better golf. Work on your five-footers and in. Ignore everything else. Maybe 10, 20% of your time uh, putting on lag putts, but only to a 10-foot circle. And that will be so good for your game. So good for your game. Until next time, Aaron Stewart saying thanks. Thanks for listening to Data Access Golf with Aaron Stewart. Check us out online at dataaccessgolf.com, and we'll see you on the next episode.